time to shift energy and come see the exhibit. Thank you so much. We do have several people who will be arriving after, so I'll be happy to provide the tour a little bit later. And because the tour and the actual exhibit will, will be here at the Trinidad History Museum for approximately three weeks or so through the 14th of October, if you have guests or family members or friends in town who'd like to see it, all you have to do is reach out to me. I'll be happy to facilitate. Mm -hmm. Many thanks to Al and Jesse, the extraordinary humans who are working here, doing such beautiful work at the Trinidad History Museum. This exhibit, I feel, is a really divine thing because <laughs> we moved to Trinidad five months ago. I've been researching Cafe Williams for about almost a year and a half. It wasn't until I was actually at the opening of my Denver show, standing in front of Fabric, talking to a dear colleague, that I realized that Cathay had connection to Trinidad. In my research, for some reason, that just never came up. I was more focused on her early life and what brought her to this place of prominence as the only known female no, black soldier. To the museum, so it was really cool when a friend said, oh, I know that part of your business model is to create art, and immersive experiences and travel. Are you following Cafe? And I laughed because I was like, no. And then they said, but you know, Cafe has a connection to Trinidad. Really? Yes. She lived here, she worked here, and she passed here. So that really blessed me to know that I ultimately landed in a place where this amazing woman lived. So the beauty of that is that now living here, working in Trinidad as artist in residence for the East Street School. We'll be here through April of next year, and I just really feel blessed to kind of navigate pathways that she navigated. So if you are unfamiliar with her extraordinary story, I'd love to provide a brief overview. She was born in Independence, Missouri, ironically, <laughs> uh, but she was born enslaved. Her mother was enslaved, her father was free, and she grew up working as a, a house slave. So she was doing the work in the house. And that kind of was her focus and her rearing until the plantation was seized by Sheridan. And then for the next year or so, she went on to move with him because they captured the plantation. They cited her as contraband, you know, because that and people of color were viewed as property and not as being pulled from the land, unfortunately. So they told her, you're coming with us, and you are going to cook and be a laundress. To which she replied reportedly, I'm a house slave. I don't cook, <laughs> and I don't know how to do that. And they said, well, we'll teach you. So her first foray into actually teaching, um, to cooking, was when she traveled with the military. Now keep in mind, during this time, this is a civil war, so she'd never been beyond the plantation. So even though it was a series of unfortunate and harsh circumstances, she had the opportunity to travel and to see war firsthand. And when I was following her travels, after she left there, she traveled throughout the West, and then she went to Louisiana of all places. I'm a native of Louisiana. She was in New Orleans, where I lived for over a decade. And those who know me know that New Orleans is very near and dear to my heart. I went to college there. I met my husband there, and it's just a very special place steeped in history. But the thing that really threw me was, after leaving New Orleans, she went to Shreveport, Louisiana, which is located in North Louisiana, which happens to be my hometown. And what are the odds of that? Mm -hmm. And she viewed and experienced firsthand rebel gunfire and the burning of the cotton at Red River which is a river that flows through downtown Shreveport, Louisiana, and also is a river that is less than 10 minutes away from my childhood home. Mm. Well, when she got out of that experience and transition, she was free, right? And a lot of people celebrate freedom, and it is to be celebrated and not taken for granted. But many, many people did not consider that now that we are freeing these humans, there's no infrastructure for them. There's nothing in place. So a lot of people found themselves at this really odd crossroads of, I'm free, but this is all that I've known. I'm free, but my family was sold away from me. I'm free, but I don't know where my children are. 
I'm free, but I have a skill set. Is it still viable? Where will I eat, sleep? Where will I go? So many people turn to sharecropping just because it made logical sense, even though it was a really corrupt and trifling system, frankly. And many people never, quote unquote, bought their way out of sharecropping, but it was all that they knew. So she knew she had very limited options, not only as a newly freed woman, but also as a woman. So, because she'd been traveling, she knew the military could guarantee three things. The illusion of safety, access to food, and a safe place to eat, sleep, and earn your own living. And she was quoted as saying, in the St. Louis Daily Times, that I wanted to make my own way. I didn't want to be a burden on the Fenton family. How many of us, regardless of gender identity experience, deeply feel in our own hearts that in addition to having quality of life, you simply want to live in peace and make your own way. So my heart resonated with Catherine. So when she got out, she knew that as a woman, she would not be able to successfully enlist in the military. And then they decided that actually released the Reorganization Act of the Army, allowing African-American troops to serve. So here lies the interesting fact. While they were looking for people to serve, and they were looking for African-Americans to serve specifically, most plantation owners in the South and the Southeast wanted no part of that. Why? Because do you really want your newly free slaves to have access to ammunition and firearms? Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. Now, as a woman of color, most people of color are really peaceful, gentle, fun-loving people, regardless of our experience and the pain we've had to navigate. But I think because they felt very deeply about this, they knew that they had to be taking care of people the way they should be taking care of people. So they said, if you're going to do this, our road is for you to have this be somewhere in the West. The West was still largely uncharted and largely undiscovered, hence Buffalo soldiers. And they moved them, what? All to the West for the most part. It would take a few years. So they were out there in the West, and their role as Buffalo soldiers was to protect settlers, to create resistance for Native populations, I'll pause again. <laughs> and to help facilitate the building of infrastructure, schools, banks, postal services. I actually have a piece right over here that is a deconstructed postal bag to honor that as well. So all of those things that people come to experience and expect and appreciate, they were on the front lines doing that. And they were oftentimes welcome to do the dirty work, to help battle and navigate and to press down and oppress the Native Indigenous sisters and brothers. But when they did that work, there was no warm flag waving for them in a hot meal. It really was, thank you, now you can go too. Even with that, taking into account, Buffalo soldiers had the lowest rates of desertion, alcoholism, they were loyal, they were kind, they were true blue. And they would see this new role with open arms. So Cathay enlisted in the military as William Cathay. And because of a grammatical slip or error, you will often see her name spelled C-A-T-H-A-Y or C-A-T-H-E-Y. It just depends. And then people often say, well, did she know how to spell her own name? No, it wasn't even on her because she was known to be illiterate, as most slaves were during that time, because it was frowned upon. It was illegal to actually read. So the person who signed her up made the error, and we're still honoring it all these years later. So William Cathay was in Company A and served in the Army for several years. And that journey took them across the country. It's also a journey that allowed them to actually see firsthand what war was about, to engage in battle, to navigate rough terrain on many different many different journeys, walking, marching, 500 feet or more, in all kinds of climates, in the wilderness. And as a result, had they experienced several bouts of illness, sickness, smallpox, infections, and by the time she arrives in Colorado, she is now navigating diabetes and other conditions because of the rigors of service. It wasn't until she went to the infirmary, experiencing another bout of sickness, uh, that she was discovered 
two and a half years or so in that she was a woman. Mm -hmm. I'm imagining it kind of looks something like this. You're not feeling well? Okay. Oh, wait, let's examine you. You're a lady. Now you have to go. <laughs> so this is the overly simplified moment. <laughs> <laughs> but as soon as they found out, she had to go. And this morning when I was preparing to come here and to share with you, I was getting dressed and I just kept thinking to myself, the skill it must have taken and the courage it must have taken to be outdoors in the rigors of the wilderness for over two years and no one find out that you are female. Mm. And if you happen to be female, you know it's a whole series of things that we have to navigate that are unique to the experience. And I just shook my head and I said, the heart of this person so they released Kathy, but because Kathy had served so diligently, they gave her honorable discharge, hmm. which is remarkable, especially given the circumstances and the times. And with that discharge, Kathy moved around, worked in New Mexico for a while as a cook, with the skill set that she acquired, and then moved to Pueblo, of all places, where she did a little bit of work uh, in several locations for a while. She met a gentleman, she got married, and it was great until it wasn't. And one day that gentleman decided that he had an extraordinary human who had amassed a good deal of hard fought resources. So he decided to do one of the most foolish things I imagine he ever did in his life. He robbed her. He took the money. She had been working so diligently <clears throat> to accrue. He took her horses and he took a watch. Now that is significant because in those days, jewelry was really viewed as a luxury. It was really hard to come by because you were in survival mode. You were in struggle mode. So when you come to view the actual exhibit, when I finish my talk in just a few moments, I really want you to lean in, feel free to walk through, lean in to the intention behind this. This has been about a year or so in the works. And there's even a watch here because this exhibit is not just about honoring Cathy, celebrating her. No one knows the actual birthday because she was an enslaved person, but we do know the birth month was September. So it was really important to me to have this during the month of September. So this is a celebratory occasion of sorts. We are honoring Cathy. This human was not honored in life. Mm. Period. Mm. But I believe through my work and my practice, through plastic art, which anchors is anchored by accessibility, history, and healing. Every time I honor an extraordinary human of color, this is my way of creating restoration. It's a way of moving forward, but also healing backwards. And think about your own personal experience. Regardless of your ethnicity or your lived experience, all of our ancestors had a tough way to go. Some tougher than others, just, just fact but everyone had a really tough way to go. And we have proof that they had amazing tenacity and resilience because we are here. So even when things are tough now, I am grounded by that notion that no matter what I navigate in this space, I can because they do. So we are honored, Kathy. This is a birthday celebration of sorts. I'll be here largely for, for the next hour or so to answer any questions that you may have. So feel free to come and go if you have loved ones or friends in the area who want to make it, tell them to pass through, it's free, open to the public. But that's what this exhibit is about. So once she found that all her stuff had been removed by her husband, she tracked him down, had him arrested, and basically said, this is where I get off the bus. She leaves and she said, you know what? I know where the kind people are. I've been to Trinidad once or twice. I'm going to Trinidad. She moves to Trinidad, her last known place of residence, and she's here sewing, because she was a skilled seamstress, cooking, and through the time period of actually staying here, she still finds the capacity in the heart to reach out to and to support other newly free persons and help people of all experiences get on their feet. That's the person that we are celebrating today. So, as her health begins to decline, at this point, she's had all 10 of her toes amputated mm -hmm. because of just the rigors of this hard, hard life. She decides to apply for her disability. And she goes in with her papers that say honorable discharge. And they look at her and they say, that's for William Cathay. You're Cathay. And then she responds by saying, well, yes, I had to do this because there was no other way. So they deny her. Even when she returns and cites that there are three women of European descent who fought in previous wars who received their benefits. And they simply say, but you're a woman of color. 
It is my belief that this was the last big disappointment for Cathay. She returns to Trinidad, and approximately nine months later, she passes away. No one knows where she's buried here. I've mm -hmm. done a lot of research. A lot of people say that she befriended and was befriended by the nuns, and they were very kind and loving to her. And after all of that stress, she just wanted to be in peace. So a lot of persons and elders in the community have said that possibly she's buried at the Trinidad Cemetery. I don't know. And while I was looking for it a few months ago, I thought how extraordinary would it be for us to find her grave and to honor her there. It occurred to me it did not matter because for all of us in our lived experiences have loved ones and we don't know where they are, but their contribution and their existence is no less important. All the nameless slaves who left Africa, none of their own free will, some who never even made it to the shore, who jumped to their death because they knew that at least they could have that semblance of control or who made it over here and endured extreme scarcity and poverty and disruption. All these people still are important, are still valued. So in not knowing her final resting place, in just knowing that the final resting place was Trinidad, I decided that was enough. That was enough. Because knowledge of someone's work is to know. So now I'll take you through the exhibit. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Everything, of course, is very, very intentional. So we'll start over here. And if, when you walk up, you'll actually see, uh, courtesy of the National Park Service, these are actually uh, copies of the enlistment papers and the denial of disability. Those are there for you to view. This is meant to represent the old school clothesline, because much of her life, she was working, not only as a soldier, we know about that in school books and everything else, but I also wanted to pay homage to the sister and sister soldier, hence the name, and who she was as a human, her traits and things that she valued. So this is considered to be a laundry collage. We have different pieces of laundry. Anytime you see these in my work, they're very consistent. I always have the netting for two reasons. One, because it was used on the early slave ships leaving Ghana. Also because it represents the constraints that we often feel ourselves. And it could be all based upon, oftentimes, perception. The things that we believe other people want us to believe when we bow to, or the things that we grow up through conditioning, embracing. Either way, when you consciously have the idea and the awareness that you can be free of that, beautiful things begin. And when we offer that grace to others, oh boy. So that's consistent through the work, the fabric. Denim is always going to be in my work. It has been for the past seven years. It was created in the West. It's a working fabric. It's diligent. That was created because people were working in the mines, working in the fields, and they need something that would not rip up a chair. <coughs> so Jenna is consistent. I will always have indigenous fabric and native and African fabric. So when I travel the world doing a show, one of the things I do every time I leave the country is ask for fabric. And I use it in my show because I feel it has so much more weight and value than just going to a department store. It has a connection, and for me, it kind of grounds me and grounds every show that I do. I made these little pants because, well, first of all, I love these pants. Um, <laughs> but not because they're adorable. I love these pants because these pants represent the child version of Cafe. For so many people of color and indigenous people, they were not viewed as having access to their own bodies, particularly females. You don't own your own body. That's why it's easy for me to, to violate you, to dismiss you, to trade you, because it's not yours. And only over the last hundred years or so have people had this reclaiming of body. I am so much more than this. My identity is more than this. You don't have the right to do that. That's how women can often be dismissed. So what I wanted to do, originally I was going to create some trousers on the dress and have it shorter so you can see, like the official trousers or sort of some Buffalo Soldier slacks. But then I got to thinking about how, how valuable it would be to actually have these because they represent the small version of Cathay because there were children's graves. Mm -hmm. There were children of people of color, persons of indigenous descent that, that had this, this was their story. So this is a way of honoring her because she didn't have the blessing, the benefit of someone honoring her as a child. So these are also created from burlap here and stitched in twine. 
the twine is used consistently throughout the show. And this, of course, represents that beautiful antebellum kind of energy and feel that people go for when you get a, a Southern Living magazine. I know it looks great, but it's so hard for me to reconcile it because I know the history behind it as a historian. But this kind of that same kind of energy and feel. This beautiful brush that you see in the show is courtesy of Angela Alliance and the amazing humans, Janet and Dimitri, who gifted us with the, the brush from Trinidad, and that's meant to kind of serve as an anchoring piece and space for the show. As we move through the show, you'll also see I have the cookware here. And this is, of course, the cookware they would have used during that time. I was really surprised to find out that cast iron had been around for a long time, um, a really long time. <laughs> and is still the best way to make a pan of cornbread. I'm just saying, not just because I'm from Louisiana. But I have that there. I also have the tambourine, the drum. The drum is synonymous with culture and history and all things coming from Africa, the root and foundation of all music and of cuisine. We want to honor that. We have some herbs here and um, just uh, some sage to really anchor and ground the space. Some books. We have a beautiful antique sewing machine here. Also, the pouring pitcher. When oftentimes I do cultural celebrations, there's a pouring of libations, either truly or symbolically, to mean that you know we're honoring the ancestors. For me, as a historian, as an artist, honoring the ancestors is the foundation of everything that I do everything that I do, because I recognize that I'm only here existing in this realm because of the divine, because of them. You also see little reminders of her life in navigating the space as well, including down to the military belt buckles. Mm -hmm. Because what? Depending on where you're going, suspenders or belts ground you and help you feel supported. And it's all an illusion, but what in our lives have we reached out to in different seasons that felt, that felt grounded and supported? We wanted to honor that for her, for sure. So this is a reimagined sitting room, because of course in the late 1800s, during the Victorian era, era and also in the early 1900s, women were only allowed to gather in public or in their homes if they were in the confines of a sitting room. And because Kathy was born into this skin, Kathy was not allowed to be in a sitting room. So this is my way of reimagining that for her and giving her a sitting room, but a sitting room that honors her experience, right? So when you come over here, you'll also see an empty chair because until everyone has a seat at the table, none of us are sitting, right? Again, with the instrumentation, the drum, the instruments. And you will also see tiny little clothespins. In my work, I often use found objects because even now, I have a capacity as a working artist to purchase paint and supplies, and I have all those good things. I imagine what it would have been like to create and how I embrace the notion of creating with found objects and found resources. So those are consistent in the practice as well. Those are well. We have a small little bowl with artifacts here and books that are very intentionally a part of the exhibit as well. We also have a piece I created a few years ago, when I was researching discrimination in Louisiana, and I created this piece. The, the actual owner lives in Denver, but it was a very large piece, and I distressed some boxing gloves and took an actual Jim Crow sign and placed it there. And I'll never forget the response I got when that show debuted. Someone said, this is really powerful, but why would you create that sign? I said, oh, no, that's Jim Crow. And then she said, who? I said, oh, honey, have a seat. <laughs> <laughs> but again, take my number and come to my studio. We don't have time to unpack Jim Crow right here. So, you know, that was a very interesting show. The number of people who were unaware of Jim Crow boggles the mind. Right. This is a cowbell. And again, even though I'm a fan of Will Ferrell, it has no connection to that now. <laughs> this is a bell because when I was researching plantations in Louisiana three years ago, we went to the famous Whitney Plantation just outside New Orleans. And did you know that depending on the plantation, when they were ready for the slaves to come in at the end of the day, they would ring a bell as if they were calling for cattle. So we reclaim the bell. Because as people of color, the widow became reclaiming, then it's a tough day. It's a tough walk, right? But when you honor that things have happened to all of us, and you begin to reclaim that with love, you can shift energy. And you have to, to exist. This small area over here, the small, Table side altar, these were common. I have these in my home, like wherever I ever lived. We grew up with them. Oftentimes they have photographs of family members, loved ones, ancestors. Sometimes they even have food, depending on the area of the country that you are, the favorite food of the ancestor. 
For this one, it's sparsely decorated because her life is so short. Kathleen Wood was arguably 50 or 51 when she transitioned. Very full life, very short life. But also, I did not want to cloud the table with images of Kathleen because guess what? There are none. Mm -hmm. The likeness you see in images is a manufactured likeness. Mm -hmm. Because as human beings, we always have to like see the thing, right? Sometimes we just can't leave well alone. We have to know, we have to be in a group or a category or an area. We have to see the thing. So people had to see the thing. So no one really knows what Cathay looks like. And for that reason, I decided not to put an image on the table because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. This piece is called The Offering. It's a bust of a woman of color surrounded by beautiful flowers backed by the American flag. The flag I use in my work is always the same flag. It's the flag that existed before the Emancipation Proclamation because for me it represents an energy and an identity that basically said you don't have value because you have melanin. And my way of reclaiming that is saying, yes, I do, and I'm extraordinary, and the people I know are extraordinary who are people of color. Also, it's called the offering because it's a woman and because for so many women, at some point in time in your life, you will feel, or be made to feel, that your only offering is the physical. And it's not rooted in truth. So this is a gentle, loving sense of resistance for that, and a reclaiming as well. We, of course, have the wash basin and the washboard with some laundry to honor Cathay's profession. We have the candles, which amongst so many cultures represent coming together, culture, community, and holding space. And we have the final piece in terms of wall art on this wall that is a commentary on where our country is. But this is a reimagined commentary because if you watch the news, if you're still one of those people who actually watch the news and embrace the news, and it has value depending on what you're watching, they would have you believe that the country is overwhelmingly red, an old ideology that is restrictive and oppressive, right? But I choose to believe in this reclaiming that while that does exist, we are shifting energy. And through amazing talks like this with partners like the Trinidad History Museum and History Colorado and persons like yourselves who came out to share with me today, we are shifting energy every time we have these stories and these reclamations. I'm just proud to do it. The background is meant to mimic a map that is burlap. It's always the backing of my pieces. This is an ancestral piece called I'll Fly Away, which is actually named after a beautiful Negro spiritual, which was a theme of this show. For many slaves who had really tough lives, you see this resurgence now of people embracing African folklore, slave folklore, and essentially it's very simple. People talked about the great thereafter and they prioritized heaven because everyday life was just so tough. It was just so tough. That's why when you hear Negro spirituals, it's always always about escaping, leaving, giving birth, taking flight. So these butterflies made from kente cloth and the white fabric are meant to represent the ancestors. And when I was doing this piece last year in preparation for this show, my daughter brought to my attention that they should be moving up top because her grandfather passed away suddenly right before Thanksgiving. So it's the very first person that she has known at six years of age to leave. So when she sees butterflies now in and around Trinidad, she will walk up to them and she will say, hello, hello, Pop Stan. His name was Stanley, and we called him Pop Stan. And she fully believes that when people leave from here, they are gifted as butterflies. So an homage to my daughter who will always be found in my work. Usually I use some version of her likeness. But for that, we are honoring not only our recent ancestor, but honoring Zoe's contribution and observation and they're consistent throughout the show as well. This is the final piece of the show. This took me three months to create. It is a beautiful dress. Now, Kathy would not have even been allowed, even though she wasn't a fan of dresses for the most part, <laughs> she would not have even been allowed to wear a dress like this. And she remembers when she was about a few weeks from actually enlisting, after she walked away from the Sheridan experience and was quote unquote free, <coughs> Someone said, you can go now, Kathy, you're free. Oh, by the way, here's a dress. And this is all, of course, taken from the article she did for St. Louis Daily Times. And she said it was a beautiful dress, 
But all she could think about was how dangerous dresses were. Because if you're working over hot boiling water and lye and the heat, it can get caught. And she had many a friend and family member who had been badly, badly burned. Why? Because the dress. Because of the dress. So the dress, in her experience, and in American culture, is a very powerful thing. It's a thing we should do, right? A thing we should love. You know, and if you're someone who does love a dress, it's very freeing. It's an emancipatory ideal or image. So, you know, there are different views on it. But for all of this, there are different views, right? And one doesn't diminish the other. So we created this dress for her, and this dress is 45 burlap sacks. Small sacks, coffee sacks, that a dear friend gifted me. I started out making it with just random loose burlap. I had bales and bales of it. And then when she brought me the sacks, I was like, this is, this is everything I needed, thank you. So when you come up to view the dress, I only ask that you don't touch it just because it breaks down fairly easily and this beauty will be traveling the country soon. Excited about that. Uh, going to all the places she served, oddly enough. Uh, but you will actually see it was a sack. So I sheared it with my cutting shears and with razors to create the detail. Again, to honor her, all of these are small burlap roses that were created. It's not one continuous thing. These were all hand done and reinforced with twine, the entire dress. So it's actually a combination of six different designs that were prevalent during the era that she lived. So you have this poofy situation, like I'm going to a tea, I'm going to a ball, I'm hoping some man will choose me. Oh, swoon. All the energy of the era. <laughs> Nothing against amazing male creatures, but that was just the energy of the era. You were raised to be saved by marriage. So, thankfully, we recognize that we can save ourselves. Um, so this is the dress. It's fancy. It's party. It's all about the party right here, you know? It's all about celebration. On this side, we're honoring where she actually was. Much more subdued, much more forlorn, it's a working woman's outfit here. The basic panel flows to here. All of these are meant to represent navigating that space, navigating that journey. It's also flat, no frills, functional. The back is meant to represent the weight that all females carry, regardless of experience. And if you're not a female, it's the weight your mom carried that you probably never talked about. Mm -hmm. We're honoring her as well. So you will see a loose corset of twine here, gathers, and again, the individual roses and a bustle that was popular during that era. And this is the dress that we're calling for Cafe. And that's the culminating piece of the show. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. For those who saw my Denver show, the piece directly over here behind Ashley is uh, the piece actually called Sister Soldier. I debuted that this summer in Denver with Nichols for my Denver show. And it's a reclaimed postal bag meant to honor the work of all Buffalo soldiers. And I love how when I read about Cafe, it still says the only known female because it gives me hope in knowing that there's a historian of someone that says, you know what? There are a lot of amazing women of color. This is the only one we know about, but I guarantee you there are more out there. And isn't that true for all women? The ones you hear about, surely they deserve the elevation, but we all know that there are more persons out there who have not been honored. So this is for her, and this is for them. Happy birthday, Cafe. Thank you for your attendance and your energy today. I appreciate it.